We are IYBA, the International Yacht Brokers Association, the largest professional yacht brokers association in the world. Headquartered in the heart of the yachting industry, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Our members span the globe with a presence in 37 U.S. states and over 25 countries worldwide and growing. Our stated purpose is professionalism and cooperation in the yacht sales industry. This places us at the heart of tens of thousands of yacht transactions annually. Our member services make that happen. So perhaps the most useful benefit to IYBA membership is availability of a full library of contracts, such as this purchase agreement. They were developed by the IYBA and a team of highly respected maritime attorneys, and these contracts allow for protection of the buyer and the seller and the broker. What the IYBA was able to accomplish by being in an organization, it gave a very loud megaphone to very few in this industry in the early 80s. That megaphone was able to set up standards of ethical practice. We used that megaphone again when we realized that we could be more competitive if we had a more favorable approach to taxing the boats that were bought and sold in the state of Florida. One of the things that I'm involved with at the IYBA is on the arbitration panel. If you have a problem and you don't want to spend huge amounts of money going through courts and wondering what a jury may or may not find in your case, is you come to people that are in the industry, that know what they're talking about. In my case, I grew up in a shipyard, also had a brokerage and charter company, and so I bring other facets to the uh, arbitration panel that many other people may not have. I'd say my favorite service would be the seminars. I find them to be very informative. I appreciate listening to the industry vets and learning from the technical aspect and legal, and I feel like I always walk away with some type of knowledge. As an EBA affiliate member, it allows us the opportunity to get in front of brokers to discuss our technologies as well as new technologies coming out in the future. EBA is an excellent organization that brings charter open houses to South Florida. They also bring webinars to the community and the yachting industry, which is a wonderful resource for everyone, including people who are not brokers. The EBA service that I feel I should be using more is yachtbroker.org. The MLS is clearly something that's very important to our industry and our customers, and it is about our customers. When we put in their name, their address into a contract, anything, any kind of language, by having it a nonprofit industry, a brokerage owned industry, owning and controlling that information adds a tremendous amount of security for the brokerage houses and the customers. It's a win-win. So there you have it, EBA. That's who we are and that's what we do. It's a powerhouse organization with endless resources as member benefits. 1,800 plus globally strong constituents, all with a clear vision and focus on professionalism, ethics, and better business for all. EBA, proud to be the standard bearer for the international yachting industry. Hi, I'm Bob Allen and I work with a law firm known as Robert Allen Law. We're a law firm dedicated to serving the needs of people in the yacht industry. And that means manufacturers, that means brokers, that means buyers, that means sellers, that means banks, that means people who sell all sorts of things and services to the yacht industry. We're a team of lawyers that has experience in virtually all the fields surrounding this business. And if you're in the business, you know how important it is to work with lawyers who know yachts, right? And know the type of problems that arise and know how to solve them. Our job as lawyers is to help deals get done. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, be of service to the industry. And we look forward to hearing from you if the need arises. We are certain that everyone can agree that costly repairs to any vessel can be prevented. The engines that power them are no exception. As yacht brokers, you're entrusted to find the perfect yacht and protect your client's investment. And that's where we come in. As South Florida's only authorized cat dealer, Pantropic Power offers an engine performance evaluation program. This program provides a 38-point inspection conducted by members of our CAT certified technical team using state-of-the-art technology and tooling. Our team members 
collect physical and electronic data such as ECM downloads, fluid analysis, as well as performance C trial reporting. After all inspections are complete, our technical team will provide you with a full written report along with a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Because after all, everyone wants peace of mind that they've made a sound investment decision. And with our program, we can offer that. It's as easy as EPE. Maritime arbitration has been around for hundreds of years. Now we have a new forum to solve our disputes. The IYBA has created the International Yacht Arbitration Council to solve our disagreements. We have experienced maritime attorneys and yacht brokers to serve on our panels, people who know the law, who know boats, and who know the yacht business. IYAC arbitration can handle yacht claims, contract, purchase, and commission disputes privately, quickly, and less costly than going to court. Sometimes disputes happen, and when they do, the IYAC is here to help you solve them. Our industry has learned that to control your data is to control your destiny. Yachtbroker.org is the key to that control. As a member of any professional yachting association, when you input your data, you are the owner of that information. At Yachtbroker.org, you can keep track of all data reports related to your company by viewing your customized live management dashboard. Create an eye-catching photo gallery with our new thumbnail editor. Follow vessels of your liking to get status notifications in current time. Identify special commission conditions immediately. And even report a vessel to our team and the listing broker. Need to have access to your fleet on the go? Yachtbroker.org is completely mobile optimized, so you can view and edit your listings from anywhere in the world. For more information on how you can get started using Yachtbroker.org, give us a call at 954-522-9270 or email us at info at Yachtbroker.org. Bonnie, I think it's time to let the cat out of the bag. Boat Docks is ready for release, and it's the only end-to-end, -end, industry owned document processing system designed specifically for the yacht sales industry. We can do everything from a listing agreement to a closing statement, your purchase and sales agreements, all the supporting documentations to make your deals happen, and an elegant manner in which to store them in folders and keep them for posterity. It's a secure environment, it's not owned by private enterprise, it's owned by us, the association. It's a great system. We've built it from the ground up. We do everything from storage of documents securely to the e-signing, and the e-signing is proprietary. We own the whole thing. Get on board with Boat Docs and smooth out your deals. Hi, I'm Bob Allen, and I work with a law firm known as Robert Allen Law. We're a law firm dedicated to serving the needs of people in the yacht industry. That means manufacturers, that means brokers, that means buyers, that means sellers, that means banks, that means people who sell all sorts of things and services to the yacht industry. We're a team of lawyers that has experience in virtually all the fields surrounding this business. And if you're in the business, you know how important it is to work with lawyers who know yachts right, and know the type of problems that arise and know how to solve them. Our job as lawyers is to help deals get done. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, be of service to the industry and we look forward to hearing from you if the need arises. We are certain that everyone can agree that costly repairs to any vessel can be prevented. 
The engines that power them are no exception. As yacht brokers, you're entrusted to find the perfect yacht and protect your client's investment. And that's where we come in. As South Florida's only authorized cat dealer, Pantropic Power offers an engine performance evaluation program. This program provides a 38-point inspection conducted by members of our CAT certified technical team using state-of-the-art technology and tooling. Our team members collect physical and electronic data such as ECM downloads, fluid analysis, as well as performance sea trial reporting. After all inspections are complete, our technical team will provide you with a full written report along with a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Because after all, everyone wants peace of mind that they've made a sound investment decision. And with our program, we can offer that. It's as easy as EPE. Yacht Engineering Week 2023. Today's focus is electronics, and we're going to talk about satellite signals and AV use. Communication, audio-visual, and how we use our signals when we get them on the boat. You're gonna get your fill of me because I had the pleasure of working with the presenters for each of these segments. Hi, everybody. We're at Marine Data Solutions today, and we're talking about satellites. Uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by Michael Rubilio, our satellite expert. Michael, how you doing? Doing very good, and you? I'm really well, thanks, and thanks for having us. So Mike, um, the topic that we want to discuss today is satellites, and satellites aren't necessarily a new thing, but as you and I were discussing a little while ago, it's interesting to, to take a look at the way technology has changed in the marine industry. You know, we even referenced when we were talking a bit, uh, a bit ago about the period of time it took from seafarers first taking to the water to where we had any electronic communications whatsoever. I mean, the Phoenicians didn't have anything. And up until the 1940s or 1950s, we really had nothing in the pleasure boat market marketplace. And then in the 50s and 60s, we started to communicate with AM radio. Uh, we had CB radios. Um, those were our only communication devices until we got into VHF. And then um, as far as navigation was concerned, we started with Loran and Loran A. Um, Loran A evolved into Loran C, which was simply a receiver on your boat that calculated the time it took from the signal transmitting from a master station to wherever you were and counting that in milliseconds and telling you a number that you would transpose onto a map and say, this is where I am, or a chart. In the early 1980s, they started to put satellites up. And we got this product called the Magellan Satellite Navigation System. And it was Mac Daddy. We could go long distances. We could be way out of sight of land. We could be hundreds of miles offshore and still get a signal. But if I remember correctly, there were periods of time when we couldn't receive a signal for as much as four and a half hours because of the angle to, from the horizon to the satellite or from directly overhead to the satellite, giving us a certain azimuth that the satellite had to pass us at in order to receive the signal. So every 90 minutes, a satellite went by. And if you were within the band of reception, you'd get an idea where you were. And if not, you didn't know where you were. But it was better than dead record. <laughs> it's better than nothing. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly right. So we, at least we had that going for yeah, us, right? Yeah. But satellites evolved significantly since then from strictly a, uh, a navigation device to be communication. Walk us through a little bit of where we started with satellite communication on the boats and where we are today. 
Well, okay, so with communication, it started out with geostationary satellites. Okay. That, and I think they're about, it's either three or 600 miles up in the air, and <clears throat> they're big and they're clunky and they're slow and they've been up there for a long time. Which means they won't be up there a whole lot longer. Yes, and the biggest drawback, in addition to in the beginning they were very slow, the biggest drawback was the latency. And latency, I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody on a satellite phone, I'm sure you have, and it's really easy to talk on top of each other because there's such a long delay between when you stop talking and I start right. that it's really weird. But that's how it started, and we've come a long way since then. Uh, now there's new satellites up there, like with Viasat, that are significantly night and day faster than the old style ones. Um, and we've also got the new Starlink constellation with the low Earth orbit satellites. Okay, so we started with um, the uh, satellites where we could communicate, we could talk, we could have telephone communications, and then we went to internet connectivity with some of the satellite systems, and now you said we've got the, uh, the new system that is giving you much, much better speeds than the old systems yes. gave, and now we have a new system called Starlink. Yes. Talk to me a little bit about what does Starlink do, how does it get, how does it work together with other systems, or is it completely standalone? How does all that work? Okay, so Starlink is standalone. It's okay. its own satellite constellation. Okay. They're how, all, many, how many satellites in the constellation? Right now, there's about 4,000 of them up there. Wow. And it's projected to be as many as 30,000. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah, so, so right now, we're probably around, you know, a little bit over 10% of projected capacity. Okay. And there's already over a million users, so they, they are launching more satellites. It's about 50 satellites a week uh, is what's going up there. And they're moving constantly. So there's going to be times when there's just not one above for you to see because we got to launch 20,000 more. So there's so times not in fixed when fixed orbit. They're actually they're, traveling yeah. around. They're orbiting the Earth. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, low Earth orbit. So the okay. so and the low Earth orbit is what gives them significantly better latency than what the older geostationary satellites had. So you don't have that half a second delay in a in a conversation. Well, the signal travels at 186,000 miles per second. So it only stands to reason that if it's 600 miles up in the sky, it's going to take a period of time to get there. Yes. If it's 200 miles up in the sky, it's going to take one third of the time to get there. Yes. So that would take care of your latency or what sounds, it almost feels like buffering almost. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Okay. For sure. Okay. It's like a delay. Okay. And you can't get around it. Okay. Uh, one of those laws of physics things. Right. <laughs> we don't mess with those. Yeah, right. We, we just say, okay. Okay. Um, but the, the new system, Starlink, is doing a lot. It's really revolutionizing everything. It's all, everything's changing now. Um, and it takes a great leap forward in speed and a great leap forward in being available in very remote locations. Okay. So a lot of people cruise the Caribbean and the Bahamas and there's a lot of places where there's just no 4G service. It just doesn't exist. There's no signal. There's no tower within 20 miles. Well, <clears throat> because of Starlink, all those places now have coverage. So it allows the people on the boats to go to far more remote locations where before there was no communication. And, you know, if the boss can't make his phone calls every morning to the right. business, then he can't be in that remote location. So this, this opens up a lot more uh, availability for owners to uh, and charter guests to use the boat in a location where they couldn't go before. Yeah, to travel at their leisure and go anywhere they want to go. Yeah. And the equipment is significantly smaller, lighter, yes. easier to install, uh, easier to hide on the boat. Yes. Uh, it's, if I'm not mistaken, when we get, to, we're going to talk about it in a minute where the signal go gets to, but it becomes wireless yes. in most applications. So while there is some hardwired infrastructure, it becomes a wireless product that allows anyone on the boat anywhere to connect and communicate, entertain, do whatever it is that they choose to do, just like a land-based, like you're used to having in your home in Fort Lauderdale or you know, Minnesota or your or, office. Or, or your office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Same thing. So what uh, Starlink does is it gives us this blanket or constellation <coughs> of satellites 
what other systems are we using to pull in? You said that not every place has 4G. Um, heck, not every place has 4G anymore because a lot of places now have 5G, right? Yes, yes. And despite the controversy about who whose 5G is and who builds it and who's getting the signal or whatever, it's, it's what we're using today. Yes. So on the boats, if you're near shore, you're typically going to be using 5G receptions. Yes, yes. Okay, when you get outside of the 5G area, what happens then? Well, so 5G is a very limited, it's a super high speed, but it's a very limited distance from the tower. Okay. So the next step down from 5G is the old 4G LTE. So that's, so if you're two miles from the tower, you're on LTE. Okay. Um, that's what we were looking at on my phone yes, a little while ago. What, yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Right. And, and um, but the maximum range from a tower with the correct antennas for, a, for an LTE or a 5G system is about 20 miles okay. with the right antennas and the, the antennas are over there. Um, but you're about 20 miles max, you know, and over in the Bahamas, I think there's a tower every 18 miles and you got about 20 miles max. So okay. it, unless you have the right antennas and everything, you, there's just going to be some spots They're where it just gaps. doesn't work, but you're going to go two miles over there and it's going to work. Okay. So when you roam out of the cellular range, then you're going to go to either the Viasat geostationary satellites, or you're going to go to the Starlink satellites. Okay. And what we're finding is that when you blend all of that together, it really helps your reliability and your speeds. Okay. So we have to have different equipment to receive the 5G signal, to receive the, um, the high-speed satellite signals, and to receive the Starlink yes. signals. So how do we, do we have to have all three of those in our device so that we can have it automatically switched? Do we have to have our device manually switched from, oh, I'm not getting much of a 5G signal, let me go to the Viacom, oh, no, wait a second. Uh, uh, how, do we, how do we bring all of that together to have a seamless user experience? That, that's what our new product, the Blender, does. Okay. So it'll take... Uh, it's made by KitchenAid, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's different made by Marine Data. Yeah, okay. completely different Blender. Uh, all right. But we do get that a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and the reason we called it Blender was because it was really hard to explain what it did. Well, it sounds and, perfectly logical right, that so it we, blends the signals, right, correct? Right, Okay. So, not only does it blend them, but it also bonds them. And bonding is a, is a method where you're able to increase the speed. So the Blender will take four inputs. So when you say, okay, I want to download this picture, on a regular piece of equipment that's not bonded, well, the one network connection goes up to the internet, however it gets there and back, and there it is. Well, with the blender doing the bonding, it sends a little bit down each pipe. Well, one pipe is 5G, another pipe is Starlink, another pipe is Starlink, another pipe is Viasat. It sends a little bit of that signal across all of them, which not only blends it, makes it a little more secure, but it also speeds up how fast the reaction time of the whole system is. Okay. So the, the purpose of the blender is to not only speed it up and make it a little more um, secure, but it also makes it to be a seamless user experience. Okay. So you don't have to wonder what happened. It's just going to do its thing. So, so we've got the blender and some antennas and stuff yes. over here on the display board. Let's walk yes. over and take a look at okay. what, what are we looking at? Where does the signal come in? So the signal is in the ether. It's up in the sky, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. And on the roof of the building here, we have a Starlink antenna. We have two, yes. You have two Starlink antennas. Two Starlink antennas. antennas Do we have over. any other antennas outside, at, like on the, up on the arch of the yacht? We, we put those here. This okay. would be what's up on the hard top or the okay. arch. We put two of them in here okay. uh, for 5G. So we've got the two Starlink routers with two Starlink antennas on the building roof. And we've got our two 5G antennas with our two 5G PEP waves here. Okay. And each of those puts out its own internet signal, which goes to our blender. The, the blender then bonds and puts them all together, increases the speed, and then there's one wire out going to the boat's network. So it takes all of your sources and seamlessly puts them together. Puts them into one place. Puts them into one output. Provides it to the network. Yes. And then you do whatever you choose to do with it right. in the network. Yes. And we'll talk about that in another segment about what do we do with the signal once it's received into the boat. So you made an interesting comment a moment ago, and that was about security. 
the big thing in this day and age, while we've become so accustomed to having a seamless electronic experience, uh, people are starting to understand and, and, you know, we have so many creative ways that people go after your signal, your information or whatever. Security is an important thing. Yes. Now, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole into a bunch of cybersecurity here, but what, what does the blender do to provide you security? Well, because it's dividing the signal across each of those sources, if somebody were to somehow look at what you were sending and receiving across one unit, they'd only see a quarter of it. They wouldn't see your whole. So the packet of information gets divided up yes. between the different sources of, yes. of, well, the reception all comes in, but on, on dissemination of the yes. signal, it gets broken up between yes. the different sources and therefore they're only getting a portion of it if they were to be able to hack right. one of them. The likelihood of them being able to hack the entirety of your distribution network for signal would be next to impossible. It would be pretty tough. Yeah. It'd be four times harder than yeah, one, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> See how I did that math? Yeah, that was good. All right. So we've got the exterior components, which are smaller than the old satellite dishes. Yes. Um, in fact, there's, uh, it's really a flat panel yes. for the, the Starlink. Yeah, um, no longer a dome. Okay. They're flat panels. Um, they definitely don't look yachting to me, but we've... So uh, we hide them. Yeah, <laughs> right. So we put them inside empty domes before. It's worked fine, hasn't degraded performance. They have new ones now that mount flat, and they got some shims that you can put on them, and we've painted them so they match you know, everything on the mast, and you don't even notice It them. becomes a lot more yeah. invisible. Yeah, you don't see it. So that's going to clean the lines up of the boat of not yeah. having to have that satellite dome on there anymore. Yes. Although you will still have the dome for the Viacom system. Is that a smaller dome than the older ones that we were used to seeing? It's about the same size. Okay. It's uh, the smallest one is a 65 centimeter dome. Okay. Um, but the the difference there is that it's a different quality of, of service, where the the Starlink is a direct to consumer consumer type service where the Viasat is more of an enterprise grade. Um, and there's things about it that make it better than Starlink. And there's things about Starlink that make it better than Viasat, but they both have a very solid place in yachting. So um, like for example, with Starlink, the only way to get more bandwidth is to launch more satellites. And they're launching them about 52 a week. Mm -hmm. With Viasat, they're able to adjust the spot beams on that satellite to provide more coverage in a geographic area that might have a lot of users in the same place. Like, for example, if you were in Staniel Key for uh, Christmas or New Year's, or maybe in St. Bart's, everybody was complaining that about on whether Starlink. Whether 50 feet or 50 meters. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. Everybody was complaining about Starlink because, regardless of the service that they had, they were getting no speed just because the whole system was overloaded. Everybody was soaking it all up. The boats that we had with Viasat that were in those areas was no problem. Viasat was able to adjust their beams and, and bandwidth and provide you know, more bandwidth to that area. Right, because okay. there was more boats there. Okay. More, or more clients with the Viasat system. So, that, so that they both have good and bad things to them, and they're both sure. fantastic. Um, but they're both night and day ahead of where we were even three years ago. So the solution sounds quite simple uh, for a larger boat. You yeah. know, you 30 meter boat, 50 meter, 100 meter boat, you've got a lot of real estate. You've got a lot of places that you can put all this stuff. Talk to me about the 35, 45, 65 foot boat. Do we have the ability to put all this stuff in a boat like that? Is it cost effective to be able to do that? Is the guy who owns that 55 footer that wants to go to the Abacos going to see the value in a system like this? And does it, is it the game changer that he's been looking for to be able to stay in communication and entertain his family? Yeah, so it all comes down to how much internet do you need? And everybody I talk to that just got their boat and for the first time is trying to set it up, they all say, oh, I don't use much internet. Uh, what do I need that for? Because I never had it before. <laughs> and two months later, they're like, okay, let's go with the unlimited package because right. I need a lot. I didn't realize how much the kids use when they go gaming. Sure. But what happens is the, the better your connection is, the longer that family can stay in a remote area and owner can still do business, the captain can still do his business. You know, everybody's able to, the kids can stream the movies, they can play games. So as much as 
everybody wants to think they don't use much of it. Well, you don't use much of it because at home and at the office, it's just there. It's, We're on the it, boat, it's not. It's interesting. We, we think about, oh, I want to get away from all of that. That's my idea of a vacation. I want to go turn off. Yeah. But the reality of it is we turn a different direction is what we do. Yes. We don't turn off. We turn to a different manner of connecting and communicating when we are away from the office. Even at family time, you know, in this day and age, the average family is sitting around the room. They all be maybe in the same room, but they're on four different iPads. Yes. You know, yes. and, they, and maybe they're WhatsApping each other when they're in the same room, right? Uh -huh. But the fact of the matter is we become reliant, dependent, and accustomed to a great level of communication yes. and connectivity. So we can have a solution that's applicable to the big boat. We can have an application for the smaller boat as well, depending upon how much you want is how much you have to invest. I noticed on one of the screens behind me, you have the ability to see who of your subscribers are online, where, and it isn't, uh, it isn't a, a, an ability to, to peak, it's really the ability to monitor what's going on and make sure that if somebody has a problem, you can reach in and help them. Yes. So that's on our screen behind us. And what that does is indicates where the boats are. Yes. And give me a little sense of what are we looking at when we look at, um, let's just pick the Abacos, for example. You've got a couple of boats that look like they're active in the Abacos. Yep. Mm -hmm. And does it tell you if the system is down or does someone have to call you and say, hey, my system's down, but then you can dial into it? It By looking at this, I can tell if it's up or down. Okay. But usually we're not, you know, there's like 400 of them on that screen. So usually we're not paying attention to it. Usually right. when there's a problem, the customer calls and says, hey, something's wrong. And generally when that happens is it's because they went from the U.S. to the Bahamas and they need to do some tweaks to their SIM cards to get the right card online in their device. Okay. Or they're south of the Bahamas and as you go from country to country, even though it's the same provider like Digicel, you still have to tweak the settings every time you go well, to they, a different they country. They probably have contracts and they have geofencing yes. and they have ways of making sure yeah. that because you signed up in Atlanta, Georgia, doesn't mean you're going to get all the signal and all the uh, connectivity right. that you would in Atlanta when you're in Barbados. Right. It's completely right. different. So, so, I mean, it's, it's fantastic that we have that. But in my opinion, when you're traveling through the islands like that, regardless of the size of the boat, in a lot of situations, the cost of the SIM cards in the Caribbean is far more than the cost of Starlink in the Caribbean. So there's going to be times when you're going to say, okay, I'm going to the Caribbean for four months, and I can either spend 3000 a month on SIM cards or 1000 a month on, on Starlink. Well, Starlink's the right choice. So again, technology triumphs because we're able to get faster service, more all-encompassing service, at a lower price with smaller equipment. Yes. So as technology advances, it gets better and better and yes. better for us. And with the blender, it gives you the ability to capitalize on whatever signal is available to you, yes. bring any one or all of them in to one place at one time. Yes. Put it all to one network in the boat, and then it can disseminate out to wherever in the boat we have that network speaking to. Yes, yes. and. One more thing that Blender does that you won't really notice. We talked about Starlink's only got 4,000 satellites up there right now and they're always moving. So there's gonna be times, three or four times a day, when you have a outage and maybe it lasts 10 seconds. Well, during that 10 seconds, if you're streaming a piece, uh, some entertainment, it doesn't really matter. There's enough buffer there to handle 10 seconds. But if you're on a, a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call or on a WhatsApp, video call, that 10 second outage, you're done. Right. And then you gotta wait till it, it comes off and back, then you get back and then in. reconnect. Okay. So a lot of people, when they're doing business, you know, and the thing cuts out every 20 minutes for a few seconds, it gets very, very frustrating. So that was the primary reason for the blender, was because it will seamlessly switch between your sources so that you don't have that outage. So even though this, one of the Starlinks went down, well, the other one can still see it, and and the, the Pepway 5G is still providing. So instead of having three sources, now you only have two, so it slowed down a little, but you didn't lose your connection. So you, you didn't lose your Zoom call or whatever business you were doing. That seamless engagement is what 
makes uh, makes the ability to cruise viable for people. Yes. It, it enables a guy or a, a woman in, in business to be able to stay connected at their leisure. And if they have frustrations in that connection, they're going to say, no, I'm not doing it. It's not ready. Right. Yet. I can't spend two weeks on the boat. I can only spend five days because after five days, I got to be in touch. I got to be Well, back. this now, you're in touch 24-7. So stay for three weeks instead of two. And it works anywhere on the planet. Yes. Yes, it does. And one of the other things it does it, when you're going through the Caribbean, I don't know if you've ever done it, try to get Netflix to work or Pandora to work or some of the stream, streaming services. When you're outside of the U.S., those don't work anymore. I'm very aware of that because I do a lot of IYBA stuff in Europe and I'll want to look at uh, my Netflix subscription and, while I'm in Europe and I go to watch a, a series that I'm in the middle of watching yeah. before I left and I get there and they say unavailable in your area. So it's really disappointing. So this fixes this solves that. that problem. This solves that problem. So even though you're out of the country, when you're using Blender, your connection to the internet is either Chicago or Atlanta, depending on which server we're on for that boat. So that solves a lot of issues that people are having when they travel. I'm thinking we might need an IYBA test blender. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> we'll see how that works in yeah. Monaco in May. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. That's really we interesting. That. So it does solve a lot of problems that people didn't have a solution for before. Yes. Besides seamless connectivity and, and, and continuity, it gives you the ability to uh, mimic being at home yes. for your signal. Yes. So what about speed? Does it give you the same kind of speeds that we're used to at home, or is that where we're going to have to suffer? So here in this office, we have Comcast, the landline, which we don't use anymore. What's a landline? <laughs> exactly. Okay. And it was giving us about 110 down. Okay. Um, if you look over here at this speed test that we did a few minutes ago, this got this 296 gave us down. 296 down. So that's two Starlinks and two 5Gs all bonded together. It gave us 296 down. So I can run it again. Now, depending on where the Starlink satellites are in view and how fast, it's going to change every few minutes. But if you'd like, I'll go ahead and press this go You press button. it, and I'm going to go ahead and do it from my phone. I'm going to join the blender from my phone and see okay. what it does. So we're at two and change. It's over three. You know, three oh four. Pretty solid. That's incredible. That's amazing. And, and that's, that's completely wireless. It's, and and it's, that's as if we were sitting on the boat in the Abacos or yes. in Antigua or in the Canary Islands. Yep. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Incredible. On my cell phone right now, it's basically pegging. And it's still climbing, figuring out how fast the signal is. So the download is 234 yep. on the cell phone. So that's taking two Starlinks and two 5Gs and bonding them all together and spreading the load across four devices. So the television that you're using for the test right there mm -hmm. is hardwired to the network. Yes, it and is. And this is wireless, and still I'm getting 234 up and 21 down. Yes. So it's a seamless, incredibly fast experience. Yes. And, and, and I could even play Tetris. Yes, just. you can play whatever you want. <laughs> and one of the other things that we do with it is like we, we encourage people to make a video call. Call somebody on FaceTime, call somebody on WhatsApp video, mm -hmm. and then while they're in the middle of the call, I can turn some of these devices off, and you'll see the call does not drop. It doesn't drop out. The call does not drop. So we encourage anybody who wants to come by and do a demo, come check it out, bring your laptop, do a Zoom call, sit here and play with it. Well, I recommend to the brokerage community that they come and talk to you about it so that they can disseminate and share that information yes. with their clients. Yeah. Because this is what's valuable about Yacht Engineering Week is being able to train the brokerage community into the products that the brokers just don't have time to learn about during the boat shows, and there's no substitute for hands-on. Yes. So, yeah, definitely I'd encourage them to come on by. Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time, Michael, I'm sorry, <laughs> to take the time and uh, explain to us what's going on in the communications and connectivity world today. Um, the next segment that we're going to do today is what do we do with the signal once we get it in the boat? Thanks very much for joining us. No problem. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks for coming by.
We are certain that everyone can agree that costly repairs to any vessel can be prevented. The engines that power them are no exception. As yacht brokers, you're entrusted to find the perfect yacht and protect your client's investment. And that's where we come in. As South Florida's only authorized cat dealer, Pantropic Power offers an engine performance evaluation program. This program provides a 38-point inspection conducted by members of our CAT certified technical team using state-of-the-art technology and tooling. Our team members collect physical and electronic data such as ECM downloads, fluid analysis, as well as performance sea trial reporting. After all inspections are complete, our technical team will provide you with a full written report along with a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Because after all, Everyone wants peace of mind that they've made a sound investment decision. And with our program, we can offer that. It's as easy as EPE. Hi, I'm Bob Allen, and I work with a law firm known as Robert Allen Law. We're a law firm dedicated to serving the needs of people in the yacht industry. That means manufacturers, that means brokers, that means buyers, that means sellers, that means banks, that means people who sell all sorts of things and services to the yacht industry. We're a team of lawyers that has experience in virtually all the fields surrounding this business. And if you're in the business, you know how important it is to work with lawyers who know yachts right and know the type of problems that arise and know how to solve them our job as lawyers is to help deals get done thanks for the opportunity to uh, be of service to the industry and we look forward to hearing from you if the need arises We are IYBA, the International Yacht Brokers Association, the largest professional yacht brokers association in the world. Headquartered in the heart of the yachting industry, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Our members span the globe with a presence in 37 U.S. states and over 25 countries worldwide and growing. Our stated purpose is professionalism and cooperation in the yacht sales industry. This places us at the heart of tens of thousands of yacht transactions annually. Our member services make that happen. So perhaps the most useful benefit to IYBA membership is availability of a full library of contracts, such as this purchase agreement. They were developed by the IYBA and a team of highly respected maritime attorneys, and these contracts allow for protection of the buyer and the seller and the broker. What the IYBA was able to accomplish by being in an organization, it gave a very loud megaphone to very few in this industry in the early 80s. That megaphone was able to set up standards of ethical practice. We used that megaphone again when we realized that we could be more competitive if we had a more favorable approach to taxing the boats that were bought and sold in the state of Florida. One of the things that I'm involved with at the IYBA is on the arbitration panel. If you have a problem and you don't want to spend huge amounts of money going through courts and wondering what a jury may or may not find in your case, is you come to people that are in the industry, that know what they're talking about. In my case, I grew up in a shipyard, also had a brokerage and charter company, and so I bring other facets to the uh, arbitration panel that many other people may not have. I'd say my favorite service would be the seminars. I find them to be very informative. I appreciate listening to the industry vets and learning from the technical aspect and legal, and I feel like I always walk away with some type of knowledge. As an EBA affiliate member, 
It allows us the opportunity to get in front of brokers to discuss our technologies as well as new technologies coming out in the future. EBA is an excellent organization that brings charter open houses to South Florida. They also bring webinars to the community and the yachting industry, which is a wonderful resource for everyone, including people who are not brokers. The EBA service that I feel I should be using more is yachtbroker.org. The MLS is clearly something that's very important to our industry and our customers, and it is about our customers. When we put in their name, their address into a contract, anything, any kind of language, by having it a nonprofit industry, a brokerage owned industry, owning and controlling that information adds a tremendous amount of security for the brokerage houses and the customers. It's a win-win. So there you have it, EBA. That's who we are and that's what we do. It's a powerhouse organization with endless resources as member benefits. 1,800 plus globally strong constituents, all with a clear vision and focus on professionalism, ethics, and better business for all. EBA, proud to be the standard bearer for the international yachting industry. Thank you for being a loyal subscriber to Yachtbroker.org, the only industry-owned MLS system in yachting. We're glad you're embracing technology to further your business interests, and we applaud your desire to utilize our exclusive ability to provide a private API feed to public-facing advertising websites. It can be the most effective way to engage with the public and drive leads to your business. We feel it's important for you to know a few things before you ask that we send your private information to public-facing sites. Some of those sites are owned by companies who also own yacht brokerage and sales companies. Some of those sites also promote for sale by owner listings where the broker is bypassed with the goal of connecting buyer and seller directly for a fee. Some of those sites also own document processing systems that cannot guarantee the absolute security of your data and will share it with companies who solicit your clients for other services thereby possibly undermining or jeopardizing your relationship with your client. Do they all do these things? Absolutely not. Are there good choices to be made when deciding on where to send your data? Absolutely yes. Our goal is to encourage you to do your homework and to choose the public facing sites that best assist you in achieving your business goals before asking us to send your data there. Thank you for listening and displaying a high level of professionalism by subscribing to yachtbroker.org, the only industry owned MLS system in yachting. So Brian, we've got questions from the brokerage audience. One of the questions that I've been asked is, Let's talk about after treatment. When is after treatment going to be a requirement? It depends on commercial or recreational, if you're a US flag. Currently, EPA tier three is required for recreational, which does not include or require after treatment. So after treatment is exempt for tier three recreational. Currently, because we're in an exemption period, an extension period, thanks to Pat Healy's team that got us a, a bought us a little more time before we have to worry about worry about doing on that road. Okay, and that's yeah. strictly in the recreational sector. Recreation. If you're in the commercial sector, at what horsepower are you required to have after treatment? So US flagged EPA rules commercial over 800 horsepower, 600 kW technically, which is roughly 800 About 800 horsepower. horsepower. Yeah. Okay, so after treatment, not required for recreational marine engines right now. We are in an exemption period. Thanks to Pat Healy and the team at Viking for championing that in, in Washington, D.C. And that deserves a special shout out because it, it took a lot of work. And they did a lot of work in the height of COVID. That was 2021, so yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's given us a reprieve from the requirement for after treatment. And when I say after treatment, just like in your truck, Brian, you have a diesel powered truck, right? I do. I what do you have to delete. do? <laughs> I, yeah, I've got to use urea, which is, uh, DEF fluid, which is a more appeasable <laughs> term for it, right. uh, which stands for diesel exhaust fluid, but it is just a, it's used as a catalyst to help remove NOx from. To remove nitrous oxide from the emissions. Correct. And that's the key element that 
we talk about with all of the emissions is the nitrous oxide. That is the next parameter that everyone's trying to meet with this highest current tier. Well, welcome back everybody. We are uh, on the 32 meter azimuth and we're going to continue our talk about signals and what to do with them. We're joined by Danny Murphy from MPI. Danny, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, we're on board at 32 Azimuth in Pompano at Marine Max. We'd like to thank them for having us on there. The boat is brand new. It just arrived. Um, it actually hasn't even been fully commissioned yet. Um, so we're doing that this week as well. So well, glad to it, have you. interesting you say that because <clears throat> what happens in the process, let's talk about that quickly. So when they spec out the products that are going to be on the boat, they go to you, you guys put the equipment list together, you make sure that it all marries up properly, right. you send it to Azimut, Azimut does the installation, they right. do all the hardwiring, and then it comes back here to the States, and what happens when it gets here? Right, so we, we pre-program it before we send it, set everything up in our shop, um, they install it to our drawing and specs, and it gets here, and... Our team gets on board and just makes sure it's all working. It's all programmed to English. Um, everything's communicating the way they're supposed to. Everything's um, working seamlessly from internet sources coming into the boat uh, to the rooms and make sure everything's working exactly how it's supposed to be. Like everything else in the <clears throat> electronics world, you have to make sure that each component is talking to the other components that it's supposed to in the proper language with the proper sentencing and giving it the exact experience that you're looking for. Exactly. For the owner, for the charterer, for whomever is right. going to be using the products. Yeah. So what you guys put together as a package and send over to them, a lot of it isn't seen, but some of it is seen. Why don't we go over to the rack sure. and let's see what the components are that you guys have put right. in this boat in particular. So on, on these azimuths, um, we like to do a lot of audio video, a lot of audio, um, streaming audio, and it's all, it's all programmed to spec with, the, with MPI's communication with the factory. And, uh, and then once it gets here, we meet with the owner and we make few changes, programming things, labeling different rooms and Wi-Fi names and things like that. But for the most part, all the equipment stays the same. Okay. Um, and on this boat, uh, they have one main rack that has most of the, almost all of the AV equipment that you ever need to get to. There are Sonos behind the scenes, there's access points behind the scenes, um, and there's one small rack in the master that just to kind of displace a little better. Okay, like some um, panels for electrical, for right, example. Right, right. Okay. So, like you said before, with different signals coming in the boat and blending it together, we use a product, um, essentially a, a network switch that's selectable, manageable, um, you can set up load balancing, um, failovers. So if you have your Starlink coming in and it's not in range or not getting signal, it'll switch over to cellular or... Well, that, that. that brings up a point that we talked about in our previous segment. So one of the ways that we can put all the signals together is in a product called a blender, which is right. essentially a digital switch. And what it does is it takes a signal from, help me with this, Starlink, Right. It takes it from PetWave, mm -hmm. uh, which is G5, or 5G, excuse me, right? Right. And then we also have a satellite signal that it can bring in as well. Now that particular product will parse the signal and bring it in and it makes sure that you always have a good clean signal for whatever AV product it is that you're using or communication product. Correct. There are other digital switches, you guys provide them as well, <laughs> but where our conversation is here is what do we do with that signal once it comes into the boat? Right. So as you mentioned, you got a KVH, which is yet another source. Right. You know, you could have a, a small wire antenna plugged into the back of a <laughs> unit for your FM yeah. signal, right? right. That, I mean, you've got a variety of different ways to get it in. What do we do with it? What good is it to us once it gets here? So we've got a couple of different things to consider. We've got audio and video mm -hmm. in the entertainment side. And then on the communication side, we have audio and we have well we can have video too as well by right. by streaming internet um, or by by working over the internet but we also have communication so where we start here is primarily AV type right correct so yes I and mean, the number one and most important question we get and request by customers is internet they want to leave the dock and feel like they're at home watching the same shows they watch listening to the same right. music communicating with work uh, so we, it comes in through maybe a KVH. I can't watch Ted set. Lasso. I'm not going on <laughs> exactly. my trip. Is that the point? Right, exactly. Okay, all right. So it all comes in, and then we manage it in our switch, and we meet with the customer on, on what, how they want to use their internet. If they want to pay when they're using it, or they want the, 
you know, most inexpensive way to use it until you need to step up to satellite. Okay. And it's all automatic and fails over. Sometimes we put a, a manual switch for people that like to actually physically know what they're doing. Okay. But once it's in, we distribute it. On this boat, audio is through Sonos. So it's a hi-fi system, it's all wireless. Um, there's a radio, so you can bring in Sirius and FM and distribute it through the Sonos in each room, or you can stream from your phone. There's a music server, so you can load all the music you want on it, get it on the boat, and now anywhere you are, your phone, your TVs, any location in the room, you can play what you're used to having. Okay. Um, and it's all distributed, all of the Sonos and access points are all hardwired. So anything that's on the boat is hardwired, so you don't ever have a failure with connection. So you don't have to worry about Bluetooth, you don't have to worry right. about Wi-Fi, anything is, is done through a Cat5 or a hardwired exactly. connection. Exactly, there's Cat5 ran all over the boat, there's An big HDMI switches here for... spreading it all out. Okay. Right. And as you can see, this boat has DirecTV, so these are uh, Balins essentially extend the, the HDMI signal so you don't have a DirecTV outside on your aft deck or on your flybridge. Okay. So it extends a signal via Cat5 and they have signal on their TVs. Okay. Um, and then any device on your boat, laptop, iPad, phone, connects to the boat's Wi-Fi. Okay. And it's And where's out. the router for the Wi-Fi? Is that So the is router's in the secondary rack underneath, uh, near the galley. So we right. have a couple of them on the boat. <clears throat> right. To make sure that you've got extenders and you've got strong signal everywhere. Right, so there's access points running off the router. So that brings up another piece of the conversation that to me is interesting, and that is whenever you've got internet signal mm -hmm. and you've got communication, security is going to be a consideration. We've got a variety of different ways that the signal can be used on the boat. We've got the crew, let's say on a boat of this, of this type, um, we've got crew and they've got their needs. Right. And then this boat in particular may be put into a charter marketplace or it may be for private use only. Right. So those can bring up three different scenarios for the use and security considerations of our internet signals. Right. So how do we how do we first let's just say it's a private use boat. How do we first maintain autonomy or or segregation for the signals in the boat between crew and owner experience? So it's it's an important question to make sure we get right. Um, in this boat particular the crew has a, a separate network running off okay. of the internet source. They have their own router. Separate password, separate separate, password. completely separate digital system. Correct. It's okay. completely standalone from the rest of the boat. The only thing they do share is the internet source coming down. But okay. after that, you can't, the crew cannot log in and see the owner's cameras, email accounts, passwords, or anything like that. Okay. So that's security that way. Moving in the charters, we usually split up the main router and make a guest network. Um, you can manage that on how much bandwidth the customers can have. You can measure it to know if you're billing for bandwidth or you're just billing for a package. Well, that's incredibly important, too. Right. Let's say we're in a remote location. We're in, we're in the Virgin Islands, and we're using some of the satellite right. services in order to provide streaming. And the charter guest has got uh, four children <laughs> right. with iPads, and they all want to be doing whatever kids do on iPads these days. There's a lot of streaming going on there. There's a lot of bandwidth used. Right. So you can dictate how much bandwidth they're allowed yes. to be used? on that, on use? that part, of, on the, the guest network, you can limit that to whatever the agreement is between the owner and the charter. Um, okay. You can have it unlimited. Some some charters do just charge flat rates, but for the most part, it's monitored and kind of Is there an ability to it. monitor how much yes. bandwidth is being yeah. used and so any, that you know any, at the end of the charter, uh, you guys use this much? Yeah, so you can manage it through the router and see what you're using daily, or you can ma manage it through the blending switch that we spoke about earlier. That also shows your data that's coming through, where it came from, um, and how much you used. So it's like having so. a, an electric meter on the side of the house. Basically, you take a yeah. reading <laughs> when you get there, and take a reading when you leave. And yep. you know how much was used, and you can bill accordingly. Right. Right. Okay. So right. we've got security, which allows the crew to utilize a separate system entirely, mm -hmm. and then the owners to use a different system. And we can parse that owner's system out to be... Uh, password protected for charter guests right. and only allow them to use a certain portion of it and he leave, leave the other idling for when the owner wants to use right. his boat and that's right. his access point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's pretty much all managed through the rack, through the system that you provide to Azimut Benetti in this case. Um, they do the installation and then you do the update and management of the system when it gets here, Correct. activating subscriptions and so on. Right. Okay. So where it goes from there, obviously, is out into our user experience. Right. So 
<laughs> every room is set up similar. Um, this room has a TV and a Sonos soundbar. It's got surround speakers and subwoofer under the couch. Okay. It all works together. Right. Um, whether or not you're using Sonos function, like people think they need internet, you don't need it to use it as an entertainment system. Okay. Um, the only time you need internet for the Sonos is if you're streaming music. Right. Um, but every room we make work the same way. So it's the same experience if you go from here to the master to the aft deck. Um, it can all be managed iPad. It can all be managed from your phone or they all have let's call it a universal remote. And it's what we've um, all become accustomed to, and that is a home theater experience right. isolated into each different area. Right. So you can be doing one thing here. With the same signal and this switching, you can be watching a football game here, and you'd be watching a movie in the master stateroom, and you could be watching cartoons right. in the guest scene. Right. They all have Apple TV and Smart TV. That's what everybody's using at home. Okay. Um, usually they're watching Netflix. So with the owner, they can basically stream unlimited depending on the plan they, they have coming in through the, through, you know, through the switch. Okay. And, the, and like I said, for charters, it can be managed. So, um, so Danny, let's have a seat and tell me, you, know, you deal with the customers uh, calling into the shop all the time, right. the people that are actually using the systems. What are the, what are the top questions or challenges that you're faced with from the customer service side of the phone calls? Uh, the top question is, is internet, like I said. That's the number one request now. Um, I think the biggest boom, biggest reason for the boom in the last couple of years, on especially boats of this size, is people still need to work and it needs to be seamless. So uh, you can't be out in the middle of the Bahamas and relying on cell data because um, you have to video in, talk to your Well, you companies. can, but you better be making a lot of money. Right, exactly. <laughs> so um, there's ways, I mean, everybody talks about Starlink. That's our number one thing right now. And it's making it easier and easier. Um, Starlink really has changed the game right. because um, it's a it's a new product. It's a new way of communicating and delivering the signal to whatever mm -hmm. devices you need. Um, and and we see that it's far more cost effective than the traditional or or, or older systems, right. uh, which are still very much in use. But Starlink really is changing the game in a lot of respects. Um, and and another point that you bring up, which is super important, is that a big driving factor in the explosion in the boat business these last few years has been the ability to work remotely that COVID kind of brought to our attention. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you can do it on the boat from the BVI or from Nova Scotia or mm -hmm. from the Seychelles, nobody else is the wiser. So if you can do it in a cost-effective manner, seamlessly, it changes the game. Yeah, and I've, I've actually had surprising during the last couple of years, I've learned a lot because some of the owners of these boats have you know, large companies with full IT teams and they basically spec out what he needs to have and you know they communicate that to me and I've learned a lot about products and making them better because of that. So it's, it's kind of worked both ways because some customers have told me they're not going to buy the boat if they can't be connected all the time. So it's extremely important and like I said, I've learned too <laughs> because of you know these teams of IT companies for their companies telling them what they need, how they need to be secure, and I learn from there. So. Well, as we all learn, that's the purpose of all of this, right. is so that the brokerage and yacht sales community that's catering to the owners can learn from these segments, the different things that the owners are asking for, the depth of knowledge that you need to know about each right. of these different products so that you can deliver a great experience to your buyers. Danny, I think that pretty well wraps up what it is that we needed to talk about today and what we do with the signal when it comes into the boat. Thanks yeah. so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Oh, wait a second. We're going to have to figure out something else to talk about because I don't think either one of us gets paid enough no. to go out in this kind of weather. <laughs> Let's go back and All talk right. about safety. <clears throat>
in the ability to forecast weather further out so we can do more route planning, so we can provide a better experience for our owners and our clients. Right, so it allows the captain, the owner, whoever's running the boat to go out and, not, and look past what you're seeing on your Sirius um, forecast, three days. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Patches Weather um, using an app. You can get 10 days, two weeks, um, and it's also instant live too if you're making a crossing. Um, the Sirius a lot of times is delayed, as you said, radar only lets you see so far. So it's live, um, always changing, and you can see far, you know, far long distance. It's time away. Um, and on top of that, routing, you can sit, you can plan your routes, plan your course, and it'll all be downloaded onto whatever app you're using that's internet based, and it can sync to your, your chart plotters on here when you go to move the boat. Um, but it gives you a lot more freedom. You can do it outside the boat, at your home, at your office. And when you get on here, it syncs via the internet because connection with the cloud and then can get into your navigation. So it's really a given, a lot more time um, is given in, to the captain to plan rather than sitting in front of the wheel and doing it all here and, you know, short forecast. Well, and something that used to be available only in the commercial sector and maybe to the big yacht marketplace was weather routers and planners. Right. So today, uh, I mean, a boat like this has every capability of traveling long distances. And while you may not want to run, you know, 22 knots. Right. If you're running at 10 knots, you're only making 240 nautical miles a day. Right. So a trip to the Virgin Islands is going to take you several days. Consequently, weather moves and you can deal with your route planners. And if there's a change in the weather, a stall or a speed up of a front, your route planners can get the message out to you if you're properly connected and help you to deviate course, lay in at a port, speed it up so you stay ahead of the weather, right. whatever the case may be. So safety <clears throat> isn't just about fire prevention and firefighting, uh, deploying a life raft overboard, doing a man overboard drill, uh, all the normal things that are incredibly important, mm -hmm. but our internet connectivity and our ability to communicate enhances the safety in the operation of the vessel as well, thereby making it even more attractive to those people that aren't accustomed to it. When we can add a different element to the ownership experience and to the boating experience, it puts them more at ease. It really does. It gives a lot more confidence. They're not leaving with the paper saying the weather's good in two weeks and it's changing, obviously. They can look at it. Everybody's comfortable using their phone. Everybody's comfortable using the iPad with apps for the weather and it's changing constantly and people are used to that. Um, and it's, it, it takes away, you know, you're less scared to leave because you're never actually disconnected. Again, what it does is it makes the experience virtually the same as that experience that you're accustomed to at home or in your office. Right. You are completely connected and you have the ability to glean all of the information that you want to have at your fingertips. It's there whether you're on the boat, in your office, at your home, and it's a seamless experience. Right. I think safety was something important to point out because it's something that we don't focus on first when it comes to, or we don't recognize first, when it comes to our connectivity. I think that that's true, you don't think about it. And it goes even past weather and navigation. It gets in the cameras for security. Right. If your boat has internet, you can see it. You can sleep knowing your boat's fine at the dock. Um, you can monitor crew. Uh, you can it really helps with safety. You can monitor <laughs> systems in the boat too. And right. I mean, we've done segments on um, systems that monitor float switches and it will tell you how many gallons per hour your bilge pump may be mm -hmm. pumping and you know that it's uh, you have a, a water intrusion or a system is failing or a, uh, an air conditioning inlet hose has failed and you're pumping water into the boat. There are a variety of different monitoring type systems that are important that we're able to now monitor from anywhere because of these connectivity right. It's issues. all logged on board, but you have no way of knowing that unless it's connected and you can see it. So. Yeah, we don't so. really like the salvage guys to give us that chip <laughs> exactly. and tell us what happened. <laughs> right. We'd rather be proactive exactly. and fix the problem first. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So. Very cool. Well, yeah, safety is an important element that we hadn't talked about before. Thanks. Well, that's a wrap for day two. I hope you've learned a lot and you'll join us tomorrow at 930 for day three of Yacht Engineering Week 2023. And that's a wrap for today. Yacht Engineering Week 2023 has been brought to you by our title sponsor, Pantropic Power the local cat dealer, and our anchor sponsor, Robert Allen Law, the business of yachts. We would also like to thank our segment sponsors, Lurson, 
Viking Marine Exhaust, Zemos, Marine Data Solutions, MPI, Bradford Marine, Ditech, Lewis Marine Supply, MPT, Tropic Ocean Airways, Wards Marine Electric, Seabot, Aquabanas. We'll see you again tomorrow, 9.30 sharp.